and welcome. I'm Chris Miller, director of the Eurasia Foreign Policy Research Institute uh, and a co-editor of uh, the book that we're here to discuss uh, today. Um, as uh, you may well know, um, this book on Russia's war in Syria was published just two weeks ago. It's available uh, on FPRI's website uh, for download. You can download the book in its entirety or specific chapters that you're interested in, and we encourage you to check it out and, and, and take a look at the book. Also, if you're not currently registered for FPRI's um, publications or a member of FPRI, we encourage you to check out our website, uh, www.fpri.org, uh, for more information on um, publications and events like these. So for today's discussion on Russia's ground war in Syria, I'll turn it over to our moderator, Anna Borshevskaya, who is a senior fellow at the Washington Institute and also a author of one of the chapters in the book. Anna? Thank you very much, Chris. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to have this uh, very important discussion. Um, I'm going to introduce our two distinguished speakers uh, who will uh, speak about their chapter, and then we'll, and then we'll, uh, we'll have a, what I hope will be a great discussion on this important topic. Um, uh, Dr. Lester Grau is a senior uh, analyst at the, for the Foreign Military Studies Office, FIMSO at Fort Leavenworth. Uh, he has served in the U.S. Army for 52 years. He is one of the U.S. Army's leading uh, Russian uh, military ex experts uh, and an author of 18 books and 250 articles. And uh, Char Char Chuck Bartles, uh, I, excuse me, I know him. <laughs> I know Chuck um, as I do less, but um, Char Charles Bartles is um, an analyst and Russian linguist at FIMSO as well with, uh, with Les. Um, his uh, specific research areas include Russian and Central Asian military force structure, modernization, tactics, um, officer, and enlisted professional uh, development and security assistance programs. And he is also uh, a space operations officer and major in the U.S. Army Reserve and that has deployed to Afghanistan, Iraq, and served as a security assistant officer at embassies in Kyrgyzstan, uh, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to first turn it over to Les. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, good morning, and thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, what we'll be talking about today is Russian ground forces contingent in Syria. And I guess first I ought to say that the uh, Russian ground, the uh, Russian ground, ground based contingent in uh, Syria is not just the Russian ground forces, but also airborne troops, which is a special uh, branch coastal defense troops, which include naval infantry and uh, uh, coastal artillery, uh, private military companies, and special operations forces. Uh, these are the folks who fight on the ground, so we're, they're, they're all part of the, the land domain that we're going to talk about. Uh, the land, uh, we're going to, so we're going to be basically talking about advisors, fires, mobility, and counter mobility the uh, new po military police force, uh, coastal defense troops, uh, private military companies, and special operations forces. Uh, when Russia went in to, in 2015 into Syria, they went in uh, primarily as an Air Force mission to, uh, to bolster the, the Syrian uh, uh, forces. And they felt that they could do it with uh, purely air support. Uh, the United States and Great Britain had found out in their their their, their history that um, this uh, reliance totally on the air force uh, doesn't always work out well. And you have mission creep, and suddenly everybody's involved. And this is certainly what has happened in uh, in the. Uh, the, the Russian contingent there. Um, the, there's a lot of missions for the ground forces there. They are involved in extensive uh, urban combat. They are involved in fights for key resources such as oil fields, water, lines of communication and supply. Uh, they are conducting conventional combat against irregular units. Uh, there's a problem with ethnic and religious cleansing that they're gotten, trying to get a, a, a grip on. Uh, there's a large number of foreign combatants of varying nationalities and motivations uh, involved as well. 
and there are contending military powers uh, fighting uh, proxy engagement. For Russia, this is a problem. They're not an expeditionary power, and entry into Syria uh, has strained its logistical resources, uh, particularly the Navy and some of their large amphibious carriers, which are ideal for carrying the, bringing in equipment and all. Um, so basically, what you have in uh, Syria today in Russian forces is not just an Air Force mission, not just a naval mission, but basically all ground forces, Navy and Air Force making a contribution and, and trying to uh, settle the area and to uh, serve Russia's interests in the area as well. Uh, basically, uh, the Russian ground forces, one of the most important things they do is advisors. And their approach to the advisory effort is different than a lot of other people's. Uh, number one is they normally live very close to the people they advise. And it's not trained individuals in ones and twos that are doing this. In Syria, they are bringing entire staffs. And these may be brigade staffs, these may be division staffs, these may be battalion staffs, but the whole staff is there from Russia working side by side with their Syrian uh, cohort and uh, to make things happen. Uh, this provides a, a lot for the Syrians, it provides a lot for the Russians. One thing it does is give them experience in combat, in handling and conducting this type of war in their southern region. It provides them with a lot more familiarity about fighting in this kind of terrain, in this kind of region, uh, to their south, which is very, very uh, essential to them. And uh, these Russian staffs rotate back intact, resume their duties with their unit, and uh, <laughs> new staffs come forward. And so far, over 48,000 uh, Russian Ministry of Defense personnel have served in Syria. Um, and many of the uh, ground force commanders and staff officers, uh, plus naval infantry and airborne forces, have uh, received much valued combat experience through this. Uh, one of the other important things they provide is fires, uh, not just air, um, aircraft fires, but artillery. Now, the folks that do most of the lanyard pulling, that do the physical firing of these Soviet systems that are brought in, are were there when they got there. Uh, but the uh, the the Russians uh, have, have developed a. Uh, uh, a very coherent artillery system, which they are bringing in place there. And one of the big differences from what they did in Afghanistan and now is spotting for artillery. In Afghanistan, they used helicopters a great deal to find targets, to protect flanks on movement, uh, to scout out and find the enemy. Uh, helicopters, you can't keep them overhead for a long period of time. They're noisy and they have people in them and they, they're large and they draw fire. They have introduced UAVs, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles that can do this job, that can loiter for hours and hours uh, on sites, provide flank security. The Orlan 10 has been one of their, their, their prime uh, uh, vessels, vehicles that, to do this. So this, this aerial robot is, uh, is not putting pilots' lives in risk. It's doing a good job. And um, they're a lot harder to shoot down. And one of the things they're not doing, they may do it in the future, there are indications, but uh, they haven't been putting rockets on, on their UAVs. What they're doing instead is using these as artillery spotters and let artillery do the job. Um, 
one of the things they brought with them was they established a combined command and control system in order to integrate Russian and Syrian forces. And this has probably been one of the major uh, success stories that they've had to date, uh, because this allows them, the Syrian forces and Russian forces, to respond rapidly to emerging situations and threats and in, decrease the incidence of fratricide and better use precision fires. And uh, they brought a lot of their uh, old and newer artillery on, on board. They're doing a great deal of testing of their, their equipment and uh, product improving it. Uh, they've also brought in the multiple rocket launcher systems, uh, including the 120 millimeter Grod, the 150, uh, 120 millimeter Grod, the 220 millimeter Uragon, and the um, 300 millimeter Smirch. And these systems, when deployed, can take out 10, 72, and 166 acres, uh, respectively. They've also brought in the TOSS-1 uh, flamethrower, heavy flamethrower system, which belongs to the, the uh, nuclear chemical troops, but it's basically a large-scale flamethrower, quite effective in urban combat, and it's, uh, though it belongs to a different branch than artillery, it's basically a very short-ranged MLR, MLRS, uh, mounted on a, a T-72 chassis, which is, uses thermobaric rounds. They've also used um, uh, short-range ballistic missiles in-country. Uh, the uh, Basically, the Iskandar has two different missiles and two different cruise missiles, which can fit on the launchers, and these can reach out to 500 kilometers for precision uh, targeting. And they've used these uh, against a number of ISIS command and control points, arms and ammunition dumps, and communication centers. Mobility and counter mobility, you've got to have engineers, and engineers are employed widely in Syria. Uh, they have provided a great deal of mobility and counter mobility. Uh, one of the things they've done is um, uh, provided road construction, water purification, and uh, river crossing. In September uh, 2017, they bridged the Euphrates River with a uh, new uh, PMM-2M bridging system, and they constructed a 210 meter long bridge across the Euphrates River in support of a, a Syrian army advance. And this, uh, this bridge stood the, the test of the mighty Euphrates up until the spring floods of February 2018, when they had to pull it apart, but when the when the floods subsided, they put it back in in order. Uh, Russia is a member of the United Nations Mine Action Service, and they have provided uh, hundreds and hundreds of mine um, an or, or, uh, EOD and uh, mine removal specialists. They've trained mine, uh, Syrian mine removal personnel as well. They brought in the Euron-6 uh, mine detection robot system, which seems to do quite well. And they have, uh, they have done a considerable job in mine clearing uh, as, as well. So they've been, uh, they've been quite, uh, quite uh, busy. <coughs> and um, uh, Chuck, you want to jump in? Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about the, the military police. So as Les said, you know, the, the ground forces, you know, it's kind of their, their U.S. Army equivalent. When we say ground forces, that's kind of like the U.S. Army. That's, that's the rough equivalent. But, uh, uh, you know, so let's talk about a, a proper organization. When we talk about the military police, um, the military police have been very active in, in uh, Syria. And the Russian military police are structured a little bit different than our U.S. military police or Western military police. Uh, it's a relatively new institution for the Russians. They, they had some internal security problems, and they brought in these military police for, uh, you know, for taking care of unit, you know, internal unit disciplinary problems and, you know, monitoring theft and, and gaffed and that kind of thing. But the military police that we see in Syria are kind of of a different variety, uh, uh, almost a totally different type of military police than what the Russians have, have uh, domestically they've been fielding. 
And these kind of a military police are more of like an expeditionary peacekeeper. They've, uh, they stood up a couple of battalions of these guys from the North Caucasus and, uh, you know, like Dagestan, Chechnya, that area, English Chechnya. And uh, they've, they've stood up a couple of battalions down there and they brought these battalions into Syria to do their security. And these guys are the actual ones doing a lot of the, you know, kind of the boots on the ground and, and uh, trigger pulling and actually going out there doing that, that show of force and that physical presence. And I, I think you know, we had that dust up last month with the, uh, you know, the Russian vehicle ramming the uh, US MRAP, those were military policemen. And then, you know, a few months before that in March, when we had the other dust up with uh, uh, the other Russian vehicle, those were also Russian military policemen. So these are the guys that we're actually seeing out there on the ground, uh, driving around. So, uh, you know, it looks like the Russians are kind of changed their model. Uh, it used to be the Russians real big on, on peacekeeping duties. That was kind of a thing exclusively for the, the Russian airborne troops, the BDV. And they had a couple other units, ground forces units that were designated to do that mission. And now it looks like they may have, may have kind of changed the model over there for their expeditionary peacekeeping model and decided maybe that instead of having the airborne or the ground forces, maybe now they're going to have these, uh, these military policemen of this, this variety that I talked about. Maybe that's now who's going to do that mission. So, you know, it's, it's significant. We, we may see these, uh, you know, military policemen in other parts of the world. I, I think, uh, you know, it's kind of lessons learned for the Russians. You know, if you have just regular ground forces out there, it looks like an invasion. But if you have people out there that are called military police, then it looks like you're doing a policing action and humanitarian support. So I think it's a little more palatable to have these uh, these military policemen out there romping around. Wes? Yeah. No, I'm, yeah. you're on a roll. Real yeah, quiet. no. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm talk about coastal defense troops. Oh, I thought you were going to talk about coastal defense troops. No, no, you're... Oh, okay. I'm up. Okay. There we go. Never mind. Sorry. Um, yes. Coordination is our strong point. Uh, coastal defense forces are basically uh, artillery, coastal artillery. Yes, they still have it. We gave it, we gave it up after World War II. And they have, have, have naval infantry. Now, they're uh, coastal artillery, unlike the uh, the old days where they were dug in into fortified positions, uh, these these are mobile, uh, but they serve a purpose, and they don't have to fire just out to sea. In fact, the uh, the coastal artillery has been used quite effectively against uh, uh, ground targets as well. In November 2016, um, a um, K300P, Bastion P, um, uh, coastal defense missile system was used against a, uh, a ground target. Not sure what it was. All I know is it supposedly hit it. Uh, but basically, it, uh, that, that is one of the capabilities of their, their coastal artillery. Naval infantry is... Uh, a uh, elite force of the of the um, the naval forces. These are the guys that that storm ashore, do uh, uh, do beach assaults and airborne landings. They have airborne capability and air assault capability. Uh, they've been primarily used, however, to maintain uh, the security of the Tartus naval base and the uh, the large uh, Russian air base that they have. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the naval infantry is hindered by their lack of a sufficiently large and modern land, uh, large landing ship uh, capability. And the um, Russian airborne has also had, uh, had a bit of problems with uh, sufficient mobility with the IL-76 getting there. However, they're there, they're doing a, uh, a, a decent job and they're getting combat experience as well. And then, uh, I'll kind of roll into the, the private military companies. It's, it's been a big, uh, it's been a big issue lately. If you follow anything on the media, talking about where these where these mercenaries are, are working at, and uh, I think they've they've shown up now in North Africa in uh, Libya, but uh, they definitely ha kind of had their start, uh, uh, kind of doing with their current mission in uh, kind of Syria and Ukraine. I mean, the, the Russians have had a long history of having private military companies. You know for like Gazprom and, and some of the other uh, you know, organizations. But this is kind of the first time they've actually used them as a, uh, you know, as a, a military force. And they're used a lot differently than, uh, 
and say kind of, if you're familiar with the US system, how we use contractors in, in our system. Uh, when the Russian military, when they're, when they're talking about contractors there, they're contracting out for like artillery and uh, tanks and, and things like that, like things that you, you know, typically do not, you do not see the, the US government contract out for artillery. And uh, these, these uh, Wagner PMCs, these, these different kind of PMCs are actually performing these very military functions. And, uh, you know, really don't know a whole lot about them. I know uh, a couple of organizations have really looked at, at what these PMCs are doing, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting. But I think as the, as the whole of the military effort there, it's, it seems to be rather small. I mean, they're in, they're in certain areas, you know, especially around the oil and gas industry, but as a, as a percentage of, of the, uh, you know, that total Russian military, you know, that ground element that's on the ground, you know, what little, little, little we know of them, it seems to be a pretty uh, small number of people you know, doing important stuff, but again, small number of folks. So, and kind of on a similar vein, maybe talk a little bit about the, the special operations. So uh, generally talk about the special operations forces. It's, you know, by nature, it, it tends to be pretty quiet or it tends to be, you don't have a lot of information about what they're doing. And uh, it seems to be pretty limited. We know there are special operations forces you know, from the Russian mass media, not only from uh, the Ministry of Defense, but also from the other uh, intelligence structures that are in there, like the FSB. We know that there's other uh, organizations that are over there operating, and uh, it's it's hard to say how much impact they're having. There, you know, obviously they do certain high-profile things, but uh, but they're generally you know probably important, really important missions. But generally, it's it's you know they do keep a they keep a low profile. We don't hear a lot about what they're doing, so it's hard to say about how much of an impact these guys are having. But I, I'd have to say it's probably a a pretty small number of the total military force, especially that ground element that's in uh, 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 Syria right now. There's, you know, it's pretty probably a pretty small number of these guys actually running around on the battlefield. So, great. Well, thank thank you both. Thank you both very much. Um, uh, so now, if if any members of our audience want to think about uh, their questions, please pose them um, in the chat function in the Q and A section. But in the meantime, um, as everybody's thinking about their questions, if I may. Um, I have a question I wanted to ask uh, Les uh, and Charles. Um, for, for Les, um, looking at the bigger picture, at all these different uh, aspects of, uh, of the Russian ground-based uh, contingent and forces, have there been any important insights or gains uh, for, for the Russian ground-based uh, contingent? And, and to Chuck, uh, of all the different elements of the, ground -based, of the Russian ground-based contingent in Syria, which do you think has been most important? We'll start. Yeah, go ahead. You start. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, there have there have been definite gains uh, and advantages for the the Russian ground forces. Number one, it gives them a chance to test new tactics, combat test equipment, develop new equipment. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've seen a lot of their standard kit being tested over there uh, for uh, future improvement but we've seen some new stuff as well. One of the areas is that of robotics. Uh, there's been a lot of fierce fighting in Aleppo and urban combat is a very nasty business indeed. And um, there's a lot of subterranean uh, combat going on. Uh, there's a lot of IEDs and mines. And so we've seen a lot of use of uh, new robotic systems uh, to counter mines. Uh, to engage strong points robotically instead of uh, with, with human lives. And uh, so, so Robbie the robot is, is, uh, is doing his part, I guess, uh, uh, Robert, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, uh, so there's been a lot of, of, of testing of this stuff, but also in the field of tactics. Uh, Chuck and I did a, a book about two years ago called The Russian Way of War. And what we were talking about were tactics for uh, conventional maneuver war under nuclear threat and conditions, primarily a fight in Europe. But all the fights aren't in Europe and they aren't basically uh, all against a peer uh, competitor. So how do you deal with a different kind of force and a different kind of terrain? And the um, the Russians have been experimenting with a lot of things, and you'll, you'll, you'll read all sorts of articles where they're talking about, um, uh, we, we did this uh, as a lesson learned from the experience in, uh, in Syria. 
and you're, you're constantly seeing this incorporated into training. Uh, anything from uh, uh, tank support uh, and, and tank firing to engineer deployments under fire, uh, laying of smoke screens, uh, all sorts of uh, different applications and in a different, uh, in different terrain, different population, and uh, not, not on home turf. Yeah, rarely do you see like the Russian mass media, like a, a senior leader, not talk about bringing the Syria experience into uh, into training, even you know back in the homeland. So they're always talking about how to, you know, what the lessons they learned in Syria, and you know how how can they kind of they take that information and uh, you know about this this new character of war that they're seeing in Syria. How can they bring that back and uh, bring it to, you know bring it back to training? And they've set up a couple new training centers. I know. Uh, um, urban warfare and tunnel warfare has been kind of a, a big thing for them in, in Syria. So they've been kind of focusing on that. I know they have a new uh, training center focused on that. So, you know, they have a lot of different things that they're, they're doing to, uh, you know, bring that information back to, back to the troops at home. And since they have those complete staffs over there, a lot of that officer core, you know, it's kind of the institutional knowledge kind of resides for the, for the Russians, not in the enlisted folks, but in the officer core. You know, these guys are all cycling, not all of them, but they're, they're cycling over to, to uh, Syria and getting that combat experience and then bringing it back and then uh, trying to implement it there. So it's, you know, it's been kind of a, uh, you know, it's a generational thing. I, I don't think you can find too many uh, generals that have not been to Syria in the Russian armed force. I imagine if you're a general and you haven't been to Syria, you're, you're probably trying to get there. I imagine it'd be a career dead ender if, if you have not been to Syria. So. And then moving on to your, your other question about, you know, which is the most important of these, you know, these ground elements that we kind of spoke of today. And, you know, I, I realize that the, the private military companies and the, the special operation forces, you know, those are definitely the most sexy, you know, for lack of a better word. And everyone wants to talk about uh, special operations and PMCs, but, you know, it's just, such a, I think it's just such a small number of the, uh, the overall folks that are over there uh, fighting. But I think the most important would be these advisors. These, these guys doing the actual day-to-day -day grind and these staffs that are helping these Syrians, you know, um, doing the planning and, uh, um, you know, uh, helping these Syrians kind of rebuild this army. And I think uh, without these advisors in there, without these, this, this uh, massive group of advisors that are helping the Syrians, I think the, the Syrian army would have collapsed long ago. So, you know, maybe you could, you know, if the Russians wouldn't have sent the private military companies or the special operations forces, you know, they might have been okay. But I, I don't see any way that they could have, uh, uh, you know, had the success that they've had without having those advisors in there to rebuild that army. So you know, they're big key as far as I, as far as I'm concerned. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so now I'm going to turn over to our audience questions and uh, scrolling down. What I'm going to do is uh, perhaps uh, take two questions. Um, and direct it uh, so, so in the interest of answering as many questions as possible, sort of try to lump them together. Um, and in um, looking at the first question, um, uh, I'm going to read the question, but in the interest of uh, taking my moderator's prerogative, I'm also going to, to shift it a little bit. Uh, the question says, uh, good morning, what is the benefit for Russia? And I would maybe uh, focus that question a little bit more, uh, sort of drawing on your earlier uh, points about the, these benefits that you've described, the innovations, uh, and, and so forth. Maybe, um, maybe if you can extrapolate a little bit more uh, based on your previous answers about benefits for Russia, perhaps beyond the military gains that you've discussed, if possible. And um, the next question is, can Les and Chuck comment on a particular area of operational weakness? Uh, in what we've seen uh, of Russian forces in Syria to date. What aren't the Russian for, um, Russians very good at relative to the past or relative to Western forces? I think that's also a great question to balance out the earlier questions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah maybe on the first one. Uh, um. Well, I think number one is Russia is a power that normally fights in Russia or with its back to Russia. It's not an expeditionary force. So why in the world are they out there? And if you look at it from a Russian perspective, where is your biggest threat? And we like to think that it's in the West, NATO. But basically, I don't think that Russia believes that NATO is going to attack Russia. And if you look at where their forces are positioned, the forces are positioned to the south and southwest. And 
The South is their primary threat. The history of Russia, they have always had to consider and had to maintain basically two different armies, one for a Western threat, one for a Southern threat. Uh, in their history, the Southern threat came first, uh, long before the Western threat. Uh, and they have uh, a long Southern border. How do you defend that? Particularly since you lost your buffer zone in Central Asia. Right. And you've got, uh, if you look at their Southern border, uh, you have the Black Sea that, that provides a buffer. And with the, uh, the change of government in Crimea or in Ukraine, it looked like they were going to lose their basing rights in Crimea. And I think this is one of the, uh, the, the springs for uh, the, uh, the, the Crimean uh, uh, reincorporation. Um, Russia has fought five major wars with Turkey over the past uh, 200 years. And Turkey is still there. You've had the problem in the Caucasus, which uh, they had their problems with Chechnya and the breakaway. And then you had Georgia and you had your, your, your problem uh, semi-resolved with Georgia within recent history. And now you have Central Asia. And one of the problems is uh, Russian, Russia is a orthodox nation, but it has a large minority Islamic population, which has not been a problem. But if it turns into a fundamentalist Islamic problem, then it is, which was uh, basically the problem during their second Chechen war uh, of this uh, last century. So I think the security issue to the South is, is vital. And Russia would love to reincorporate some sort of buffer zone, uh, stretching from uh, Syria across to Afghanistan. Now, this is not going to be the old Soviet Union, but it's probably going to be done with treaties and, uh, and uh, organizations and such like this. But uh, I think they feel that they're big threats in the South. Yeah, I mean, General, we do more like the, uh, you know, the military aspect or the, you know, more the tactical thing. I think there's more of like a strategic question about you know, why, why they would go in there. I don't know if there was a, you know, looking at these ground elements we're talking about, I don't think there was a you know, reason to go in there just for these ground elements to, to practice these skills. I, I don't think it was laid out that way. I don't think there was opportunities. I think they, they felt they had to go into Syria. That was kind of the, the general deal is just because they, they saw this deteriorating strategic situation, just deteriorating situation in the, in the South. And they were worried about that uh, instability spreading up in from the, uh, from that South into their, uh, kind of volatile South Caucasus region. So, you know, definitely a, that's more of a <laughs> bigger picker, bigger picture question, but uh, getting to the, to the, the problems that they've had there, if uh, there's been any kind of a weakness shown for, for the Russians, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of an inherited system. They're, they're like Les said, they're used to fighting with their back to the border. So they're not really prepared for these expeditionary operations. So when they have been doing this uh, Syria confrontation, you know, it's, it's a ways away and they've had to, They've had to leverage all their logistic assets. So they've had the, the North Fleet has been real busy with with their uh, you know, hauling supplies back and forth. They've had to buy a couple of tenders to get to get these supplies. So if there's anything that's stressed out right now, that any kind of stress we're seeing, I, I think it would be in the logistics sides on, on how do you support this uh, you know this this animal that's uh, you know this ongoing warfare that's going on uh, you know a ways away from your borders. So they're you know trying to supply that thing. That's that's kind of where they're. Uh, we talk about the Rapuches. Yeah. Yeah, well, the uh, yeah the the Rapucha class uh, carrier amphibious landing craft uh, was based built primarily in Poland during the '60s uh, during the Warsaw Pact days. These things are on their last leg. They were going to replace them uh, with the Mistral system built by France, but after Crimea, uh, France said no. Um, we're not going to deliver the two that we built for you. And so Russia has now trying to keep the amphibious fleet going. 
and then they but they've had some problems doing it. They are they're they're, they're sort of like the uh, the problems the U.S. is having with its icebreaker fleet. You know, these things are ancient, and just uh, just trying to keep them going. Uh, the other thing is their their sole aircraft carrier. They sent it down there. It was it it needed it needed uh, refitting, and while it was down there, it proved it needed refitting, and it's now being refitted, and it'll be a couple of years before it's it's back on on the water. Great. Um, uh, I'm going to move on to our next questions. And again, I'm going to try. We have a lot of great questions. I'm going to try to uh, get to all of them as possible. Um, so looking at the next ones, um, how much, uh, and this is a question to both panelists, um, how much progress has Russia made in joint operations, especially in integrating um, in operations of ground and air forces? Uh, what is the size and capability of Russian fires present in the region? Have they displayed any type of collateral uh, concern? And lastly, uh, to what extent has Russia been using cyber weapons in Syria? I, I can tell you right now, we don't know anything about cyber. If it doesn't explode, we don't know anything about it. But uh, uh, maybe for the first question about the... Uh, uh, it's, it's not our, I think somebody else is talking about, uh, I can't remember who was t did the part on air, on the air part of this, of this conflict, but uh, I mean, I, I think that's definitely been a, a key part of this. And uh, one of the big kind of interesting developments that, had, that has happened recently is that the new chief of staff of the, the Russian uh, VKS, the aerospace forces, kind of like their air force and air defense and space troops all kind of put together. It, it wasn't a, uh, a guy from that community. It was a, uh, uh, you know, a Russian ground forces general. It was a ground forces general that they brought in there. So be, imagine if the chief of staff of the Air Force, of the U.S. Air Force, was a, some army general that got promoted into that position. You know, that'd be kind of a big deal. And the, the Soviets had done it a couple times back in the day, but this is the first time that the Russian Federation has has done that, you know, since the uh, since we had a Russian Federation. So it, it's interesting they brought in this army general to, 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 to for this role at the at the VKS. And uh, one of the reasons maybe is, is how he's kind of, when he was in Syria, when he was running that ground opera, I can't, can't think of his name right now, but how, you know, when he was in uh, Syria running that ground forces, running that operation out there is, you know, it's how he's integrated. So maybe that's the direction that they kind of want to go is, uh, you know, a better integration between the uh, ground forces and the, and the VKS. So, and I can't, what was the second question was? I'm sorry, Anna, what was yeah. the second question? What is the size and capability of Russian fires present in the region? Have they displayed any type of collateral concern? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, uh, uh, fratricide is, is a fact of combat, unfortunately. They, uh, I think they have made some efforts to keep it reasonable, under control. Um, when they're in a fight, they're in a fight. Uh, you've seen a use, more use of precision fires in this conflict than I would expect to see in normal conflict. These things are expensive, but with the UAV and all, they can, they can reach out and, uh, and do the same job with the, with the conventional artillery. As with precision, it's just not may not have the range. So I think there there has been an attempt not to increase civilian casualties, but unfortunately, where you have a, a war in a place where people can't get out of the way, or you're not sure who's there exactly, things are going to happen, and uh, there are going to be lives lost. It's, it's not so much how much fires or artillery you have there; it's it's how you can you know. It's the ability to find the targets. So, you know, uh, you can have all the artillery pieces you, you know you want in a, in a given area, but if you don't know where to point those pieces, they're not much good to you. So, I think their big effort is is how do we how do we get the the um, you know the reconnaissance and able to find those targets. That's that's kind of what they're I think the big uh, you know kind of takeaway from this thing is, is is how they're how they're finding the targets. You know, they're using these UAVs. They're, they have all the not just UAVs, but they have other methods of finding targets too. You know, signals intelligence and and uh, uh, ground surveillance radars and you know people on the ground. So I think that's kind of been what the the big thing for them is that they've been pretty good at finding the targets on the ground. And as for collateral damage, I, I just don't think there's a 
culturally in the US collateral damage is a big deal, but for the Russians, I think just uh, it's a cultural aspect of them. I, the, the society seems to be a lot more uh, attuned, you know, for you know accidents or whatever happening. They don't, they don't seem to be a big problem with mm -hmm. Russian people as for U.S. people. Um, all right, moving on to the next question. Somebody had asked uh, a similar question. Is there any evidence regarding Russia's use of electronic warfare in Syria? Um, uh, feel free to talk about that, but I know you said earlier that, uh, that you're not really looking at cyber uh, issues. So we think, I think cyber is different than electronic warfare. I think, you know, I, you know, I think a cyber is more of like going through the computers and doing stuff, but uh, electronic warfare, yeah, they do have quite a bit of uh, uh, electronic warfare presence on the ground. Uh, particularly, they had a few years ago, they had a drone attack where the uh, people had thrown, flown in drones and uh, they, there was real concern about you know, why they weren't successful. So I imagine GPS jamming is, is a big deal there and uh, communication jamming, but uh, yeah, that, that, is a, that is a part. We just, you, it, obviously, since it's not kinetic, it's harder to see. So, uh, you know, we don't, we don't see it as much, you know, just because of the, the nature of the technology, but yeah, that's definitely an aspect of the fight. And I would imagine it's more, yeah, before. And I would imagine it's not for finding the targets, but for, or not for, uh, you know, jamming stuff all the time, but you also use it for like locating uh, positions. Mm -hmm. You know, they also kind of use it as a as a signals intelligence means of, of locating things. So those those electronic warfare assets they have on the ground are, are kind of dual purpose. You know, direct jamming and then finding targets. Less. Oh, you've covered it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we don't know a whole lot about UW. Yeah. Sure. No, and uh, I mean, uh, if I may very quickly, there it's it, you know it's a very interesting element of Russia's behavior in Syria. There's certainly been reports on Russian electronic warfare jamming um, and so forth. But um, uh, let let me um, move on to the next question. Um, although the Russian ground forces operate on very different principles than NATO militaries, have they done or learned anything that could be applied by Western militaries working with through host? Uh, nation and local forces. Um, now, there's a personal. There's a question for me, and I'll address that in a second. Uh, but in, but for Les and Chuck, the second question is: How openly does the Russian military uh, discuss tactics, uh, the use of new weapons systems, etc., in their publications? Uh, I'm asking about uh, useful information that they know. Um, other powers might read, uh, not glory stories. And, and uh, so these are excellent questions. If I may, there's a question for me also um, asking, is that a small statue of Donald Trump on the dresser behind you? Um, it is not. Um, it is uh, a picture of a woman uh, and it is uh, a, a part of a personal family art that has been in the family for generations. It is not Donald Trump for the record. Um, <laughs> Okay. What, I'm sorry, what was the first? What was the first? Yeah, we're through us. <laughs> of course, it threw me off as well. I apologize. Um, uh, although Russia, so Russian ground forces operate very differently um, on very different principles than NATO militaries. Have they done or learned anything that could be applied by Western militaries? I was, yeah, I, I think the the way that they're uh, doing this, they call this reconnaissance strike complex or a reconnaissance fire strike complex. Right. How they're they're merging their fires, their uh, artillery systems with their UAVs. It's, it's a very different way than, than uh, you know, at least from my knowledge of the U.S., the way the U.S. does it and probably the way that NATO does it. They're very good about um, rapidly getting that information from these guys in these UAV teams to, uh, uh, to the actual firing batteries as opposed to, you know, we have kind of a Byzantine system in the U.S. where we have, you know, has to go through all these wickets and uh, in order to designate a target. And the Russians, you know, they're really good about, you know, just doing things really simply, you know, instead of having this, this big, huge system, you know, they put the guy with the UAV, you know, they just put him in the same place where the guy with the artillery system's at. And he just tells them the coordinates where to fire. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of like the, the keep it simple process. They do a lot of stuff. And then they're, they're really working, you know, that's on the on the one end of the spectrum, on the, more on the complicated end of the spectrum. They're... Uh, we're trying to build a network of, of fires. So we have all these in the U.S. system. We have all these different systems, and sometimes they talk together, sometimes they don't, and you know they're made by different manufacturers. The Russians have been really good about standardizing everything. So if, if you bring in a piece of technology into their, you know, a sensor or a computer or you know a, a weapon system, it has to be able to talk to their network. So they're 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 better integrated. And I, I, you know that's that's kind of what they they say in the mass media. How well that's done, I, I you know I have no idea, but 
Um, they, they seem to be having success with, they have a new system called, or not a new system, they have a system called Strelitz, which they have their, where they, they direct their fires. And it, it seems to be the go-to system, you know, for uh, not just ground fires, but naval fires and uh, air, uh, you know, air attacks. So they have everything kind of integrated into this one Strelitz command and control system. And it seems to be, seems to be pretty effective. And, and were, to jump on what you're saying, they have developed a combined command and control system uh, to, in order to integrate their own air and ground forces and naval forces, but the system has also been extended to integrate the Syrian, uh, the, the Syrian government forces. And I think this combined picture, this overall picture, where you've got a, a much wider view of all the targeting in the area, what's going on, what can be addressed when, uh, is, is uh, really quite an accomplishment. And I think when you, uh, so, so looking at basically their ability to combine the understanding of what's going out there from their various sensors, and then to address them uh, rationally. So not everybody jumps on it at the same time and you, you, uh, you waste ordinance or you have a stack up problem. It, uh, you wanna talk about the, the, how open they are with the technological journals? Oh, um, uh, Chuck and I, we, we work for the Foreign Military Studies Office, which is an open source uh, office. And basically what we do is we read Russian journals and newspapers and keep in contact through their open source material. We, we don't, uh, uh, we don't bother with the classified material. And um, because what we write for primarily is a training audience. So we, we try to give the best information out there to our soldiers uh, who, are, who are going to be training uh, against uh, these kind of systems. And really, I've been doing this for ever. I keep, every once in a while, you'll hear me uh, slip and say Soviet instead of Russian. Uh, but that's where I where I started this thing back in the back in the 80s, and um, there, um, you know, there's a lot of information. There's a lot more information. Yeah. yeah nowadays, <laughs> holy net. Yeah. yeah I, I had to do a lot more uh, uh, deducing and uh, bouncing sources against each other to figure out what was going on. Uh, now they are much more open. What what's going on, and um, is is there a little hype in, in some of the stuff they write? Yes. Is there a little hype in some of the stuff we write? Well, might be. So, uh, but but I think uh, it's it's uh, a lot more open nowadays. And with all the electronic means and everything that are out there nowadays, how could it not be? And uh, the the question about um, uh, how. Um uh, uh, I, I think you've already answered this, but perhaps if there's anything else you want to say about um, uh, any more about the discussion uh, in their publications. Um, in t so, uh, in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, information that they know other powers might read, not glory stories. I think part of it they they want to, uh, you know, they would definitely want to project strength. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think you know after the kind of the doldrums of the '90s when when there was a. Russian military is a basket case. I think they want to, they want to let people know, hey, they're back. They're a world power. They're not, you know, they're not dysfunctional. They're not, you know. Uh, so I, I think part of it is is they don't mind that that information going out about what they're doing. You know, they want people to know they're at the forefront of these different technologies. They're not trying to keep, you know, if they're making an advancement, you know, they want people to know they're making these advancements. They want people to, you know, know they're a leader in the world. And uh, uh, so I, I think it's part of the messaging. Right? And I think part of it also is military sales. Yeah, it's they're uh, they're they're a, they're a major player in the in the military equipment market. And if you've, you're coming up with an improvement for the um, BMP two or the BMP three, you're going to want that known. And so, um, hey, India, look what we're doing. Uh, you ought to you ought to take a look at this. And uh, and and have we got a deal for you? So I, I think there's there's um, they're, you know, they'll, they'll do a little chest thumping. Uh, they're not the only government that does that. 
Right. So we have uh, nine minutes left uh, of this very uh, rich discussion. And unfortunately, I don't think we can get to all the remaining questions. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, take the remaining three and just sort of summarize them rather than reading them uh, to just get to the main points uh, of the question and, um, and pose them to both Les and, and to Chuck. Uh, so first, there's a hardball question about basically Donald Trump and his Russia and Ukraine dossier. And uh, I, I think the essence of the question is whether you think that they, they, the Russians could have had a free hand to deploy all, all kinds of uh, uh, um, eclectic forces in Syria. Um, second question is, if you can reflect on the comparison um, of U.S. military's effort to conduct uh, their advise and assist mission in Iraq and Afghanistan, one with the Russian efforts in Syria. In other words, has the US, as the U.S. has struggled to evolve, um, do you think the Russians have a model we can use? Uh, and uh, lastly, perhaps, th this is more a technical question, but I, I think it's an important one. Um, what, do you know of the level of casualties the Russians have experienced, casualties in their advisory uh, personnel? Yeah, hey, honestly, with the, uh, we do mostly tactical stuff here, so we don't look at the big picture, you know, <laughs> we, just, we just don't know, I don't know, like, what the, you know, the, the political imaginations are, so it's just, this is not something we look at, but in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the advise and assist on how they're doing it, I mean, I think, you know, we have this, we have called the SFAB system, our uh, Security Force Assistance Brigade system is a, is a method that we're, we're using here in the U.S., and the Russians, uh, uh, you know, and that's pretty much where we have these brigades that are set up with experts, officers, and NCOs, they bring these guys in, they put them in a brigade and they send them out to, to train. Uh, the Russians, like we said, they've done a different model. They're taking the whole staff, you know, instead of having a, a group of a specialized training, they're taking their whole staff and, and planting these guys in with the Syrians. And I, I don't think, it, I mean, it works, it works for them. I don't think it would really work for us because, uh, uh, you know, the Syrians had a Soviet military beforehand. I mean, they had a Soviet based military. And these regiments and brigades, regiments, divisions, and brigades they had, you know, those are, it's a very, it's a very similar system to what the Russians have, you know, it, it was all based on that Soviet system. So they could bring those staffs in and put them in and, uh, you know, those guys could go and, and sit kind of with their counterpart on this, their Syrian counterpart, and they would, you know, have a different language, but, uh, you know, they, they know the same system. And with the, with the U.S. SFAB model, uh, you know, it's totally different than the way that the, the Syrians would fight. And, um, uh, so I don't know if it would, uh, I don't know if it would make sense or with to take a U.S. staff and put them in with a, you know, Syrian or another army staff because the, the, the way that they do things are so different. And I think trying to retrain, you know, like a Syrian army, trying to retrain them or any army in the, in the midst of uh, ongoing combat operations, try them in a new staff system, you know, moving over for a Soviet system, more of a Soviet style system, more of a U.S. system would, would just cause a lot of problems. So, and I don't know if, if, uh, you know, if that methodology would work for us in, in certain other places, but, um, you know, just because it works good for the Russians doesn't mean it's going to work good for us and vice, and vice versa. You know, what's good for the goose is not always good for the gander. So, plus, do you know anything about casualties? Or, about casualties? Or anything about the uh, No, not really. Um, yeah, we, we don't we don't know much. I mean, there hasn't been a lot of casualties. One of the reasons the casualties the reported casualties have been so low is because the Russians are not out there fighting. You know, for, for lack, you know, for most of it. These guys are in the staffs doing the advising. You know, the Syrians are out there doing most of the ground to ground fighting with the exception of, of, you know, the special operations guys, the military police and uh, the PMCs. But most, the most of the rush contact is either for the ground element is with these staff advising missions. So, you know, the Syrians are out there, you know, shedding the blood and the, and the Russians more on the planning side. So we don't know, you know, nobody, I don't think we, they're not open with the exact casual numbers, but they, I would imagine they're a lot lower than, uh, you know, when, uh, what we have in, in Afghanistan, Iraq, just because of the, the difference of the way this, this thing's unfolding. So. so. Right. Um, great. Well, uh, with that, and so we're basically coming to the, the end of our discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope um, everybody reads this excellent book. Um, uh, there's lots of rich material, a lot of food for thought for uh, Russia's Syria intervention. Uh, it's an incredibly important uh, event that is going to continue to matter uh, not in, not just for the Russian Federation, but also for our relationship with Russia, great power competition. Um, and uh, and, and uh, I hope I hope you get to read this book. Thank you very much for for attending. Thank you for hosting us. Thanks.